like to now welcome uh, Commissioner and Chief Judge Fidel De La Velle, uh, and his staff. The Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings is an independent agency that conducts administrative hearings for city agencies, boards, or commissions. Oath oversees the operations of four tribunals, the Oath Tribunal, the Environmental Control Board, ECB, the Health Tribunal, and uh, very few people know this, but the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, Tribunal. Uh, these tribunals hold more than 400,000 hearings annually on a diverse range of issues. OAST's proposed fiscal 2016 expense budget totals $37.8 million to fund the four tribunals, including personal <laughs> services funding of $28.4 million to provide for 252 full-time positions. OAST generates revenue for the city through the collection of fines issued by tribunals for various violations. Combined tribunal revenue totaled $137.2 million in fiscal uh, in, the, in the previous fiscal year. We look forward to hearing your plans to improve operations at Oath and what we can expect in terms of the tribunal's performance and customer service as measured in the PMMR. Um, as is our practice, we will ask uh, you as well as anyone else that you may ask to testify in response to any of the questions, though I'm sure you uh, have, it, have it all. Um, so do you affirm to tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, you need to turn on your microphone to say that. Absolutely. Thank okay. you very much. And if you'd like to proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Levine, and staff. Um, I submitted a statement, uh, and I'm not going to uh, uh, read it verbatim, but I'll, I'll summarize what it says, essentially. Uh, and uh, part of it is I want to put into perspective what oath is. I've been in my position since mid-November, and much to my amazement, a lot of people have no idea what oath is, what it comprises, and what it does. Uh, so I'll very quickly uh, put a little header on this. Uh, oath was originally conceived by Mayor Koch in 1979 with the concept that um, anyone appearing before a city tribunal should appear before a tribunal that is independent and doesn't have an interest in the outcome of whatever controversy they're uh, being called on upon. Uh, that got sidetracked, I won't go into the details, but got sidetracked in, for about 35 years. And about uh, five years ago, uh, we started to pull together uh, what Mayor Koch's original vision was. Uh, we had the original Oath Tribunal, which uh, as originally conceived, essentially uh, did full-blown trials of um, city agency disciplinary cases uh, and licensing revocation cases where somebody would be losing a serious city license, for example, a million dollar medallion uh, in a taxi cab case. Since then, we have pulled into uh, the oath umbrella uh, three other tribunals. Uh, one is the Environmental Control Board, which despite its name is uh, just a tribunal. It really doesn't do enforcement. It doesn't do real policy work. It basically takes in and uh, adjudicates summonses from approximately 16 different city agencies, ranging from sanitation, fire, police, buildings, and so forth. There's the health tribunal that was pulled in. It, it's uh, title is self-explaining. It takes in uh, summonses issued by the health department. And uh, the taxi tribunal, which deals with summonses issued relating to uh, the vehicle for hire industry, which is quite a lot. Um, right now, uh, oath is divided into uh, mechanically into those four entities. The tribunal, the main tribunal, which is the trials, what I, what, I, what I call the trials division, the original oath, now involves not only disciplinary and cases and disability cases involving civil servants, but includes zoning matters, seizure cases, that is vehicle seizure cases under uh, uh, court mandate, we have to do a preliminary hearing to determine whether the police department can retain somebody's uh, seized vehicle. License revocations, conflicts of interest board violations, 
vehicle forfeitures, loft law, SRO cases, human rights commission violations, lobbying registration violations, and other regulatory cases, including city contract disputes. If um, a contractor uh, believes he should be paid X amount for extra work done under a contract and the city believes it's Y amount, it's taken to oath for arbitration. What our goal is, what, we have, we, what we've found is that as of right now, there is a disparate uh, system for the public where you have four different tribunals, each tribunal uh, responsible for cases from almost 20 different city agencies. All of them have different rules, different procedures, different deadlines. What we've decided to do is to divide oath into two divisions, a trials division and a hearings division. The trials division would be what I described as the original oath a tribunal. That's the tribunal that deals with the complex cases that involve full-blown trials. A uh, disciplinary case, for example, can take several days just for the trial part of it. It could involve uh, multiple conferences before that, all taking up time of an administrative law judge and counsel on both sides. The hearings division, which is what uh, uh, where you would now find taxi cases, environmental control board cases, and health cases, um, are more direct responses to summonses issued to, to individuals. It could be a, a, a summons issued by a taxi inspector to a taxi driver for, for whatever. It could be a building's violation. It could be any number of uh, sanitation violations. Sanitation is our biggest writer of summonses. And those are generally adjudicated by a hearing officer, uh, sometimes a representative from the agency, sometimes not, sometimes the summons is prima facie on its, say, on its face, sometimes uh, they have an attorney or an inspector testifying on behalf of the agency, and the respondent, who's generally a businessman or a member of the public. And that, those cases are generally very straightforward and can, take play, can be resolved within a half hour as opposed to several weeks. Um, our goal is to uh, create a uniform set of procedures and rules for that. Our goal is to further um, make it easier for individuals to deal with a complex set of summonses. If you're a small businessman, we want you to be able to, depending on the case, of course, be able to adjudicate, have the matter adjudicated by telephone or video conferencing or by mail. Uh, problem now is the procedures vary a lot from agency to a, a, an enforce, enforcement agency. Um, we are consolidating uh, office space. We have offices in all five boroughs. In Queens in particular, there are two locations which are um, to put it delicately, primitive facilities. We expect to move into a new facility by the end of this calendar year where we will consolidate environmental control board hearings, health department hearings, and TLC hearings for that borough. Uh, at our IT system is now four different IT systems. Uh, the first step when the consolidation began was to reconcile the, the different IT systems into a system that worked for communicating between the agency that, uh, that's the enforcement agency and our tribunals so that the summonses and so forth would be timely received by the tribunal and someone who had a sanitation summons could walk in and take care of the summons rather than us telling them, we never heard of your summons before. Uh, to make sense of what I just said, um, some agencies do electronic uh, writing of summonses. You're familiar with uh, the, the, the parking violations bureau type summons, where somebody does it on a, on a handheld device and it immediately shoots over to their computer system. Of the 16 agencies that we get summonses from, 
Some do it that way, and some of them do it with a quill pen and uh, a, a paper summons that they then send to us. Sometimes we get it two, three weeks after the summons was written. In the meantime, the respondent could have shown up at, at our facility and wanted to pay the summons or deal with the summons or contest the summons, and you have no idea what's going on. Um, in those cases, when we get the summonses, we have to have them scanned and then data entry uh, put in and goes into our system, and all of those steps can, can uh, inject errors into the, into the process, where at the end of the exercise, uh, if there's an adjudication, uh, the Department of Finance doesn't know who to go and collect the money from. Uh, our goal is to eventually uh, have a, a uniform system to, uh, to write those summonses and, and appear on our calendar and we can move them efficiently. Uh, we are moving to cross-train our hearing officers. You, we can have a situation where, for example, in Queens you have a hearing officer that specializes in sanitation summonses and a different hearing officer that specializes in health department summonses, and you could have uh, 20 people ready to have a hearing, they, they walk in for the health department summons, and five people for uh, the other agency summons, and the hearing officer there is un underutilized. Our goal is by cross-training them, we can, we can divide the work uh, more efficiently, not have uh, people waiting outside like it was an old-fashioned dentist's office uh, to get uh, uh, business taken care of. Um, that's, our, that, that's essentially our, our, our new vision for Oath, uh, one including uh, being able to adjudicate online, what we call one click. Uh, it's kind of cute, but reference to a, a mouse. Um, but also accessibility. Uh, the rules from the different agencies for a lot of this stuff are very, very complicated. Uh, and we're trying to put on our website uh, how to make it easy for people to understand what they're dealing with. One of the things that uh, I found frustrating is that uh, you can have somebody one day uh, receive a health department summons, go through the process, think they know what the process is to deal with the summons of the city of New York, then get a sanitation summons, and it's an entirely different process. And when they walk away, they'll just think that uh, we are inept, incompetent, or just plain crazy because the process is different. Uh, and each one is different. That's leg a legacy of how things developed over the last 70 years. It is our job now to uh, drag us into the 21st century. Um, one of the things that we're doing with respect to that, te that technology uh, that I alluded to before is we have four different systems for uh, dealing with summonses. Uh, the goal is by the end of this calendar year to essentially have one system so that at the end of this exercise that we, we, we're engaging in now, somebody can walk in who uh, owns a, um, a diner on Flatbush Avenue who may have gotten a sanitation summons, a health department summons, a buildings department summons, or whatever summons, and theoretically could walk in with all, all of those summonses in his hand and sit down in front of one hearing officer and have them dealt with at one time, rather than going to different offices, different boroughs, different rules, different deadlines, which really makes us look like the Keystone Cops. And I don't like looking like the Keystone Cops. Uh, not unless you pay me a lot more money. <laughs> and uh, M Max Sennett is my boss, um, who is not. Um, let me touch briefly on the question that I know is near and dear to everyone's heart here, because essentially that's what brings us all together today, which is revenue. Um, by its very nature, uh, uh, a civil tribunal, an administrative law tribunal, when somebody's found guilty, they're found guilty, there's a fine imposed. And that is uh, money 
that is owed to the city of New York. Um, I can't speak for the Commissioner of Finance, but I know that uh, we are of a similar mind on this issue. Um, to my mind, it is important that, and, it con and it's consistent with the original vision that created oath, that the hearing officer or the ALJ who's presiding over a case not be influenced by the outcome of the case. In other words, they don't care whether one side wins or the other side wins, one side loses or the other side loses, and nothing should even remotely influence that hearing officer or ALJ leaning one way or another, in, in fact or in appearance. In the last 70 years in the United States, I think I've said this before, uh, we have gone f into a, a, a country that's basically run by administrative agencies. And adjudication of issues before those administrative agencies, whether it's the Federal Communications Commission or the New York City Sanitation Department, uh, is handled at administrative tribunals. And how a citizen views their government is not how they encounter government in criminal court or civil court because virtually nobody winds up in criminal court, despite the statistics, uh, but how they walk away from uh, an encounter with the government when they got a, a, a summons from the sanitation department because they didn't recycle properly. And people should walk away knowing that they had a fair hearing, that they had a fair opportunity to present their case that the city had a uh, was fair in presenting its case, and that someone gave them a fair hearing and weighed the facts and came to a decision. Whether they win or lose, I want somebody to walk away believing that they got a fair hearing. Uh, we have achieved that with the Oath Tribunal. One of the measures for that is that more and more city employees are opting to go to the civil, ser the civil service law route on a disciplinary case, which brings you before the oath tribunal, rather than the grievance procedure route, which basically takes you within their particular agencies, because feedback I'm getting from union leaders is that they believe that they, they get a fair shot uh, at oath. I want to create that same image whether you're going to the Environmental Control Board, the Tax and Limousine Commission, or, or uh, the Health Department. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony. Thank you for your lifetime of service to the City of New York for taking uh, the leads at oath. Um, in, my, in the previous testimony that was provided last year, I was impressed by uh, the agency, and I'm e even more impressed than I was before, thank you for your commitment to a fair and equal uh, si justice system um, and uh, for sharing my postmodernist view that uh, our government is only as good as the people, as the, the belief that people have in it and for, for that being truly where the existence comes from. Um, again, I'd like to, to, to loud a lot of what you're doing in terms of the one-stop shops um, and I, in fact, if we cross-trained our people issuing the summonses and violations. Uh, we'd be saving a lot of the, the money that you'll be saving on the flip side of it with regard to cross-training of judges. Um, one quick question is, how soon do you expect your one-stop hearing centers and cross-trained, uh, cross uh, and forgive me for using judges, uh, hearing officers uh, to be uh, available? Uh, and, and before I forget, we've been sorry. joined by Council Member David Greenfield. Uh, the process of cross-training uh, hearing officers has already started um, uh, with uh, health and taxi and uh, uh, starting very soon also um, uh, consumer affairs cases. Um, what was this, uh, the other part? 
Uh, how, how soon will we have the one-stop oh, hearing one -stop. centers up in all five boroughs? That uh, is, I expect, in the, in the next calendar year, in part because we have to get the facilities consolidated, especially the one in Queens. Um, and we have to consolidate the IT system, which I also expect to be completed well, our target is June. I'll be happy if it's done by the end of the year, knowing how IT folks uh, progress with, uh, with uh, testing and making sure that the system works. We don't want to put in a system and then find out uh, the next morning that uh, we can't find somebody's summons. Um, my goal is 2016 for most of these initiatives. Um. Throughout today, my focus is going to be a lot on the PMMR, and uh, I believe in setting goals and achieving those goals or reassessing what our goals are. Uh, so with regard to the PMMR, do you have it handy or can we provide you a copy of it? Um, but with regard to the PMR for oath, um, what I found is throughout it, there were a lot of asterisks for places that uh, your agency has not set goals for itself. Um, and uh, in terms of targets. Meanwhile, you've got an agency that has amazing performance. Uh, so I guess, uh, for, for, for instance, um, uh, well, yes, please. So for, for your goal number two, uh, adjudicative alleged violations of the city's local administrative law, hear cases promptly and issue timely decisions at the ECB, Oath Health Tribunal, and Oath Teal uh, Taxi and Limousine tri Tribunal. Um, Almost every single target is an asterisk. There, there are no targets. Meanwhile, you're doing amazing things with performance. Um, so I guess the question is, would you share why they, they are left as an asterisk and uh, whether or not you'd be willing to set goals? Well, you have touched on a very sensitive topic to me <laughs> because, um, uh, as I said, Earlier, I got here in November, and uh, looking at the statistics that we generated, uh, I had a bit of a problem reconciling, to me, logically, how they worked with what should be an adjudicatory body. Uh, Long-term picture is this. Um, we are going to be remodeling them significantly what the uh, metrics are. It's, metrics are very difficult in, 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 these, in these cases. But some things are obvious. Uh, summons is issued by Department X. It's received by us uh, with a return date. And what is the process to when that case is closed as far as oath is concerned, which could be the Respondent paid, paid the summons right off the bat, which happens in a significant number of cases, almost 40%, I think. Or they ask for an adjournment, or there's a default. Any of those steps. We have specific criteria for folks who default, folks who request uh, an adjournment, folks who request a vacating a default, and so forth. The metrics that I saw in my mind did not adequately capture the work involved there and what the goals should be. For example, um, uh, default. What was the timeline from default to somebody's case finally being uh, sent over to Department of Finance as a, a docketed case? And is it because the person asked for uh, the case to be reopened, that is to vacate the case, whether it was reopened or not reopened? Those things, there's gotta be a way to capture that. It's not easy. It even gets even more complicated when you get into the uh, uh, trials division where you could have as many, for example, a disciplinary case from a city agency uh, a law enforcement agency that I won't specify right now, um, 
you could have as many as four pretrial conferences where uh, the department or the respondent is uh, asking for discovery, where uh, the defense, the respondent's attorney is making a motion to dismiss parts part of the charges, and the uh, ALJ has to review the motion, the papers submitted. It's it's a full court trial. So I, I think uh, I, that I, easy to quantify that. So I. I I think that I, I share your commitment to picking measures that are correct. Uh, so my, my hope is that by the time the mayor's management report rolls around, uh, there, are, there are new measures uh, versus just uh, sticking with the old ones. And then similarly to the places where you actually did choose to provide measures, uh, my hope would be that you would choose measures that set higher targets because if we are investing additional funding or new funding, um, there are places where uh, the average time for the oath tribunal to issue decisions after records uh, closed, mm. business days. Um, your current goal is 25. However, uh, there is no time in the past five years that you've ever done it in less than 18 days. So let's set the goal from 25 days where you will almost assuredly fix, hit that to something more aspirational where um, it's either 18 days or 15 days, which seems to be the average. That depends on two things. Yeah. The volume of cases that ALJs are, are dealing with and uh, the complexity of the particular case. What I mean is this. Um, in the last four months, we have had a, an incredible surge in the number of cases going to oath trials, which has pushed back trial dates. Uh, a year ago, you get a trial date within two weeks. Now it's taking two months to get a trial date because of the volume of cases. A lot of the volume of cases is a result of more and more uh, city employees choosing to go to oath rather than the, 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 the grievance process. We started taking cases from the Business Integrity Commission which uh, uh, are giving us a, a large volume of trials. So, so you anticipate that number changing based on changes. So that, I think that's reasonable. I just would like to make sure that um, things are reflective of actual goals. Uh, I, I think one of the things that you, you, you hit on in your testimony is uh, revenue. So we, the, the more revenue we, we bring in, the, the more we're able to spend on uh, essential programs like education and uh, social services and whatnot. So um, last year we, we found that $1.48 billion of ECB debt was outstanding. Um, and uh, of that, uh, there's 1.5 million outstanding violations and 24% of that whole amount is interest. Um, what, what can ECB do to uh, make sure that we get those collections up front without it going to collections. I think you touched on it. How, how quickly are things now getting to Department of Finance and what are we doing in order to collect ECB fines in a timely manner and just how, how, how are you addressing that our overall problem so that we can make sure that we never end up in a situation again where we're looking at $1.5 billion that we could have collected over the past six years? Well, <clears throat> well let, me, let me quote the, the Finance Commissioner. Um, it's not ECB debt, it's New York City debt and it's Department of Finance debt. Um, and let me clarify what I mean by that. Um, the Environmental Control Board's function is to adjudicate and it's not supposed to be to uh, create a debt that's owed to the adjudicator. Um, I think we have uh, uh, learned a lesson, at least uh, currently, that it's not uh, appropriate to have uh, the adjudicator uh, be a revenue generator. Having said that, it is at the same time revenue that we know naturally is going to be generated from violations because not everybody's innocent, uh, that that revenue stream is not choked because uh, there is a, a choke in the, in the process of adjudicating it and transmitting it to the 
uh, agency responsible for being the sheriff of Nottingham, basically, the, the tax collector, which is finance. The choke point should not be at, at ECB or health or TLC uh, tribunals because they all uh, wind up uh, imposing fines that are owed to the city of New York. Uh, we have a committee with the Department of Finance we have developed whereby uh, our goals are to transmit the data necessary for finance to collect the debt. At the same time, we want to provide a mechanism whereby the enforcing agencies that issue summonses have data that they can use uh, so they can analyze it and figure out how to best uh, allocate their enforcement resources and train their enforcement resources. We can't tell them how to do that, but we can provide them with the data. I'd like to recognize uh, Councilmember Greenfield who'd like to make a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, uh, to note that, uh, you know, I've, I've been sitting through these uh, budget hearings for, I think this is my fifth year now, and normally when it comes to uh, oath, we have a long litany of things that we'd like to see done differently, and there are frustrations and there are concerns, and I will say, and I'm very pleased that this is actually the first time I've sat through uh, an oath budget hearing where I hear from the Commissioner and uh, Chief Administrative Law Judge a commitment for justice and transparency and improvements that you've actually uh, set out. So I just want to say that it's very encouraging and uh, certainly very pleased, and I actually appreciate that aside for the public sector experience that you had back at the TLC, recently you've had private sector experience, so you get to see things from both sides of the equation. I think that's uh, a significant improvement, and obviously you're relatively new, so we're going to give you some time to uh, make some changes, and uh, very appreciative at your commitment uh, to justice and to lack of conflicts and transparency, and really just to making things simpler in what is uh, generally a very complicated uh, jungle at oath. So thank you for that, and uh, look forward to having you back in the future and hearing about how these things are progressing. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll add a, a little uh, thing that you just mentioned that I was at uh, TL, I was TLC chairman back in the early 1990s. Um, and the tribunal at that time was on the TLC. When I left TLC, the entire package of TLC rules was about four pamphlets that were about a quarter of an inch thick and about five inches across and seven inches high. That was it. Right now, unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, you couldn't pick them up. It's like seven, 18 volumes of, of eight and a half by 11 stuff. That makes life a lot more complicated, not only for the people who have to enforce those rules, uh, the inspector on the street, but the guy uh, answering it. And I don't think TLC is, is unique in that aspect. In the last 12 years, there's been a, a bloom of, of uh, regulations. Um, and having a tribunal that is just as, as Kafkaesque sometimes and, and, and convoluted doesn't help, uh, doesn't help the people of the city of New York. I don't think it helps uh, this country, doesn't help this government. And uh, at least from where we sit, where we have to adjudicate this stuff, uh, our goal is to make it as straightforward and as logical to a normal human being who doesn't get a Master of Laws degree from NYU or Columbia to plow through it. Um, I think at the previous hearing, it was alluded to, you weren't here, uh, the issue of uh, reps instead of attorneys appearing in cases. Uh, I have to admit that when I first encountered administrative proceedings in the city of New York at the hearings level, I was appalled that people were being represented by non-attorneys. Uh, I, I went like, what is this, the illegal practice of law going on? But the flip side of it was, um, the rules are very complicated, and most people can't uh, afford an attorney to go through it. At least they hire somebody that 
is familiar with the rules and the process. Uh, some agencies call them expediters, some agencies call them reps, whatever. In my experience, uh, it's better than not having an attorney. It's not as good as having an attorney because I have seen cases fail because something that if you went to law school in year one, you would have jumped at a defense that's not obvious in the rules because it's a fundamental legal thing. Uh, but that's the world we live in, and my goal is, is to make it more civilized. So I just have to say that is very high praise coming from Councilmember Greenfield. He's usually not nice, that, that as nice to people who are testifying before this committee. So uh, please, please take that for, for, for what it is. Um, we're running about 15 minutes behind, so if you I'm could. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. If you could make your answers a little bit shorter, that will be, uh, uh, your, your, your friend and colleague at the Law Department, Zach Carter, will be incredibly grateful to you. That's tough for me to be short and succinct. <laughs> fair, fair enough. So. Um, in your uh, testimony, you indicated there was a 67% increase in the number of alternative hearings conducted by oath since 2012 when hearings, w where, when hearings by phones and hearings online were uh, launched. Um, you've currently had 37,932 health hearings. Um, so I guess uh, s some quick questions around the alternative adjudication methods. What percentage of cases are being resolved via the online one-click adjudication system? and how much sa savings of money is being represented there, what alternative adjudication methods are available for TLC, tri the Taxi and Limousine Tribunal, and uh, with the mayor's recent released Small Business First plan, it says that it will open up alternative hearing options such as phone or internet hearings to more violation types. So what violation types are included in this? And then we still have a couple more questions to run through, and we are in negative time. Okay. I'll give you, I'll give you the, the, the easy one first, which is what violation types. Uh, that, that is dependent on uh, the enforcement agencies. They're the ones who are going to have to decide which violation types they put into those categories. For example, right now there are many particular violations. Uh, one I'm most familiar with, the Tax and Limousine Commission, which explicitly state on, in the rule that the, the, the respondent has to make a personal appearance. Um, I expect that there will be many, many more cases that will be resolved by alternative methods for various reasons. Um, the, the primary reason is it's, it's the easiest, most simple way for somebody to do a non-complicated uh, uh, case, which is what most summonses are. They're very straightforward. It is or it isn't. Uh, how much does it save you know, financially? If it's one-click method where people submit either uh, online or on, by mail, snail mail, because they still have that, um, it still requires a hearing officer to review them. However, if a hearing officer is reviewing one-click cases or um, snail mail cases, that hearing officer can probably knock off approximately 35 cases in a day. If you're doing cases by telephone, live by telephone, it'll take just about as long to do that case as a live case because you're, you're dealing with people, you have to introduce information, uh, speak to them, uh, explain to them what's going on and so forth. And that Generally, right now, it takes about a half hour, whether it's inter vivos with a person sitting in front of you or otherwise. Uh, where we're going forward and expanding, um, uh, we are now talking, to, for example, with the uh, Port Authority Police. Port Authority Police writes a lot of the summonses that, uh, well, not a lot, but they write summonses that we adjudicate. Um, uh, provide a mechanism whereby the Port Authority police officer can testify um, by video conferencing and doesn't have to uh, come to our facility. At the same time, we want to provide the same ability to respondents to do that. Ultimately, I don't expect, to be perfectly frank, that it will save a huge amount of money. What it will do is it will make the process uh, better for the businessman and for the public and even for uh, 
the enforcement agencies. The okay. enforcement agencies in particular have uh, told us that they like these processes because they can have their enforcement personnel on the street rather than hanging around at uh, one of our hearing centers uh, waiting to be called in for a hearing. Great. Uh, with regard to um, the PMMR, which we both agree could have better performance measures, uh, if either now or in, in a written response, looking at fiscal year 14, um, or the four, I'll stick with that, but there are similar numbers in the fiscal year 15 four month actuals. Uh, I'm seeing notice of violations received by ECB Tribunal 566,566. ECB Tribunal hearings conducted 195,284. ECB Tribunal decisions rendered 142,390. So first thing I'm seeing 300,000 cases disappear. Then I'm seeing another 50,000 disappear. And there's similar numbers for the um, health, tri health tribunal and, and taxi and limousine tribunal where the, the violations come in, there are fewer hearings and there are even fewer decisions. So um, in terms of the new measures, I'd love to find out what's, what's happening to all of them. How many of them are uh, defaults? How many of them are not? How many of them just the person pays right off the bat and so forth? Most, I asked the same question when I saw those numbers. <laughs> Uh, most of them, it turns out, were people who actually just paid the summons. Uh, didn't even get reach the, the, the level of a hearing. Um, and for the folks who did go to a hearing but don't get a decision? Folks, uh, he hearing and uh, decision, I can't give you a, 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 an answer that I'm comfortable with. Um, some of it, I suspect, is overlap. Um, <laughs> A lot of it is you go to a hearing and request uh, an adjournment, or you have a hearing to request a, a, a reopening of a case, uh, basically vacating a previous uh, uh, finding. Mm -hmm. Those are, are things I want to drill down into and, and get more meat out of. When you get those numbers, uh, we'd like to see those numbers too. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in trying to bring people on, pay them a living wage, pay them full time. Um, I noticed that in the PMMR, you've got a uh, head count of uh, 460, um, while in, your, uh, in, in, in the numbers that our finance committee has, we've got uh, numbers around uh, 250 or so. And then in your testimony, you say you have 250 employees in fiscal year 2015, and you're going to get another two, but you also have 320 per diem attorneys. Right. So I guess the question is um, whether it is possible to actually bring those attorneys on full time or a portion of those on full time, and whether or not there would be a, a cost savings. And again, the idea is that as responsible employers, we have people who work for us full time, and we're not putting them in a position where they end up having to be on social services while working for us, which sadly the city is not one of the best, ha, does not have the best record at. Well, not too many attorneys are, are in danger of uh, winding up uh, uh, needing the services of social services, but uh, our, our business model on the hearing side has always been uh, per diems for uh, some very good reasons. Uh, the volume of cases fluctuates dramatically. Um, just going back to my experience with the taxi tribunal, uh, a lot of the summonses that you see are seasonal. You have uh, summonses at a certain time of the year that increase uh, violations, and we are also at, uh, at, uh, at the mercy, essentially, and scheduling on the enforcement priorities of different enforcement agencies. The point being this, uh, at any one time, we know you know, about a month in advance how many cases are going to come in. And we have a roster of approximately 320 attorneys who are on a, an attorney line, per diem attorney line, 
and their function is to be a hearing officer. We know uh, on a certain date that X number of cases are gonna come in. We will ask those individuals if they are available for those dates and they will come in and, and, and do whatever the volume is. But if you drill down a little deeper, if you have, for example, a day where at, uh, say, the Brooklyn office, you're going, you know you're going to have 25 cases coming in. Uh, you will look at your roster and you will see a particular hearing officer who can knock off 25 cases in a day without any problem. You'll call her and ask her to come in and if she comes in, she'll do the 25 cases. Rather than look at the roster and see a hearing officer who's perhaps less productive, two hearing officers that just do 10 cases a day, you'll have to call in three hearing officers. Or you can have a situation where you know you're going to have 40 cases coming in on a particular day, then you will know that you can either call in four hearing officers that do 10 cases each, or one hearing officer you know who does 30 and one who you know does 10. So you call those two guys in. That flexibility uh, allows us to budget consistent with the demand uh, in caseload. That's the, one of the, that's the main reason that the city has used per diem hearing officers historically from the 1980s as far as I know. Thank you for the transparency around that. H how does somebody get on the attorney list and uh, how are, and is, how, how do you go about, uh, are people just chosen from the list as they cycle through or do some people get preference and why so just, um, well, sorry, just uh, I'm big on <laughs> civil <laughs> service and uh, making sure that there's equity. You get, you get on, you initially get on by applying uh, and you go through an application process, including an interview with uh, a deputy commissioner, a, a managing attorney and a deputy commissioner. You have, you have to be and, admitted and at where least. Where can people watching online at home right now or reading the transcript go to apply for a job as a per diem? There are literally thousands of un unemployed lawyers who just graduated law school this year. Um, well, we have to have the vacancies for them, but in any case, um, the, the, actually I'm, I'm doing a, a lecture at Brooklyn Law, uh, Bar Association next week on exactly that subject. Um, uh, you're interviewed, uh, you go through a DOI background investigation. You have to have, be uh, admitted at least five years. Uh, you then go through our Judicial Training Institute, which is about two weeks of training uh, in the evenings uh, or during the day on the processes of oath. Then you, you join the roster. It is essentially up to the person to decide how much work they want to do. They're limited to a thousand hours a, a year. Um, if they uh, advise the managing attorney that they're available, then the managing attorney juggles the roster to put them in together with other folks. Um, if I were doing the, the, uh, the scheduling, I would obviously lean towards the more experienced folks first, but you have to bring in other folks, otherwise they'll never get any experience. Uh, that's the roster method right now, and right now it's, it's split between the three uh, hearings divisions. Uh, when we get through with our exercise of, of cross-training, it'll be easier for somebody who typically does health department type uh, cases to be able to do sanitation type cases. And we'll get, there'll be greater flexibility across the board. Um, one thing that I think you are alluding to is our, 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 our people discriminated against because of the way they make decisions. Uh, I've gotten feedback from um, uh, former colleagues um, who are now uh, colleagues again, 
regarding concerns about that, and I've gotten uh, feedback from um, representatives concerning that. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about what folks may have done before or didn't do before, because my information is anecdotal and therefore inappropriate for me to say. But um, I have said this to staff, and I'll reiterate it here, that if anybody attempts to influence a hearing officer, never mind an ALJ, and I don't care what their title is, I don't care where they think they're coming from, if they happen to be from an agency and they happen to be an attorney, I will refer the matter to the Appellate Division Grievance Committee for Unethical Conduct. And if that person is not an attorney, I will do everything in my power to terminate them. I am really, really vicious about judicial ethics. I think where I was going with that uh, is, is what I see every day, which is patronage and uh, people using the list to reward their friends and allies or people who volunteer with them on their political club. And the things that I get to see every day, day in and day out in government that I would like to see stop. That uh, I'm gonna be talking to an agency specifically about that later today. <laughs> that, 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 that I consider to be inappropriate in a judicial context, that type of behavior. That is refreshing to hear. The, thank you so much. I, I have one last question. Uh, I, I'm incredibly impressed about consolidating the, the four different systems. Um, with regards to that, uh, do you have a specific system in mind? Are you going to be consolidating into the NYSERV or are you investigating other systems as you're now having a chance? And are you looking at a free, libre, and open source software license so that whatever system you end up building, you own the code to, and you can make changes to if you don't want to, and fire a vendor, hire a new one, but you get to keep it. And then ultimately, you could share it with any and all other judicial systems in this nation or on this planet. <laughs> and what cost savings do you think will be associated with combining all four systems? Um, what I envision is at least three of the systems will be combined. Right now, uh, my, my uh, IT folks are leaning to a particular system which the city has an unlimited license to, uh, which I think is important because uh, I think we've all had experiences where if you have uh, an off-the-shelf system like we have at the Oath Tribunal, you're pretty much locked into the license of that, uh, that software vendor. Uh, we are in the process of investing a lot of money in uh, rewriting uh, a code. We're doing it essentially in-house with uh, uh, our staff people and uh, uh, quote uh, consultants. By the way, in the context of, of the IT world, a consultant is essentially a freelance programmer that you hire for a project. Uh, it's not uh, IBM or uh, Northrop Grumman or one of those deals. That, that, that would be your agency, and I, I am very happy to hear that. Here at the City Council, we like to hire people who can't even build a stealth bomber. Um, and uh, as far as the Oath Tribunal goes, uh, we're going to be visiting our friends in uh, the Eastern and the Southern District. Um, I'm a big fan of PACER, which is the federal system, which is a, a, an open system. Uh, it's, I remember when it started, it was a royal pain in the neck. Uh, right now, I think it's uh, the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, PACER is the, the system that the federal court system uses for uh, tracking their cases and doing filing and basically being uh, paper-free. And uh, our goal is to eventually be paper-free. That's, you say all the right things. Um, I hope it works. <laughs> yes, no, it, PACER works. I, I actually was on the city, New York County Lawyers Association Advisory Committee advising the 
court, the court clerks for the federal districts in New York and DC where they are all run out of and they are, they, it is the largest, it is the largest success project and money maker in uh, I think the federal government or at least one of them. Uh, in terms of the code that you're developing in house, you're gonna own that, you're gonna license that free library or open source and post that code for other municipalities to use? Well, we're going to own it. Uh, the licensing to others uh, may be a decision that has to be made at a pay grade higher than me. Fair enough. Thank you so very much for the, the visionary work that you're doing. We look forward to working closely with you and uh, to making sure that we get all this ECB debt collected up front and make sure that every single New Yorker has a seamless and positive experience when dealing with the city of New York. So many people don't realize that they're dealing with the city of New York the second they set foot outside their apartment or turn on their water or pick up their phone. Uh, but ultimately when they talk about the city, they're usually because they got a ticket and now they're dealing with oath. So anything we can do to make that process better or make it easier for people to appeal their decisions or appeal their, their violations on the phone or online is amazing. Thank you for your leadership on this and to your entire staff. Thank you very much. And, I'd, and I'll just add that uh, I want people to understand that Oath is not an enforcement agency. It's an adjudicatory agency. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.